Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, in the South, like, music and religion kind of have an overlap, mm -hmm. just like anything else. And, I, I, you know, I was raised in the Smokies, and growing up, what I kind of deemed redneck shit was stuff I just wanted to get away from, sort of thing. And then I moved to New York and lived there for a decade, and that stuff started to feel like home, and I missed it, and would listen to a lot of that music. It's like, I had a really wild time in New York. Yeah. I was out of my mind. So that so kind of acted as an anchor. And, you know, I mean, I think it's pretty pretty easy to see the overlap of just like um, the underpinning of kind of a sad nature to country music. I mean, that's one thing that praised about it. But, you know, addiction, religion, and shame, and violence are these kind of underpinnings that follow throughout all that music. And so, you know, I, I saw those parallels with my own life. Um, and so I just kind of randomly started painting Western style paintings at some point. Mm -hmm. When I got back, um, I got into doing sideshow banners. And I love doing portraits. I used to do gigantic, like 10 foot portraits of my friends that they would hang over their beds and stuff like that. So this, it just got smaller and more concise yeah. and stopped being about my buddies. And instead it was about these kind of music stars that, you know, I didn't know personally, but in some way, like they kind of been a soundtrack throughout a lot of pretty difficult times. Um, yeah. Do you think that, because a lot of your stuff is so big, like we've got Clint over here, the banners, we had that huge piece that we tried to bring in. Too big. Um, too big. But do you think that came from, because I know you did some set work as well, like what made you want to start big? A lot of people are scared and they start small and they get bigger and mm -hmm. bigger, but you started mm -hmm. huge. Like. Well, I, I was, when I was in college, I was studying biology because I was wanting to go into pre-med. Ever since I was a little kid, I was like, I'm going to be a doctor. Yeah. And then I had this kind of meltdown and didn't want to do that. I was trucking through school and doing really well, and I took this trip with a girl I was seeing at the time, I think I was 19, and I went into one of the galleries and there was a mother well um, that just you know, was the size of this entire gallery. And I stood there and had a really intense kind of, I, I would say a spiritual moment, yeah. you know, um, that I felt. It was like I kind of had this low grade electrocution and I kind of became obsessed with it. So big pieces, you know, there's nothing better than, you know, going to a big gallery and being yeah. kind of confronted with something like monumental that kind of stares you down. Like you're not the viewer, that thing is like an alien that's standing over you looking down on you. So, yeah, so I, I like working big. Um, I started working smaller in New York just because there's no room. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so then I got here and was able to kind of spread out. And um, so I kind of took advantage of that. You know? yeah. Instead of a tiny little corner cubicle gallery with like 50 other people like I did in New York, I had my own house that I just crammed with shit. Right. Yeah, and some of that stuff in here too. I mean, going back yeah. to what you just said though about the monumental, I had a very similar experience that kind of brought me here with a George Gross painting, but it was mm -hmm. bigger, like twice my size. And yeah, that confrontation is yeah. a spiritual moment. It changes you. Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes big pieces, you know, they're not as easily contained. Yeah. You know, I, artwork, visual art, um, you know, it's it's a precious object. It's a totem, you know. It, it carries with some kind of spiritual, um, uh, it, it, it's just got a little electricity to it. So when you get something big that you can't put your hands around, it's a little more aggressive, yeah. you know. And so I do like working big, and my house definitely shows that. Yeah. I have tons of giant stuff. You know? <laughs> For sure. And like I said, we do have you know stuff from your house that we wanted to bring. We wanted to hang this very salon style, as you can see. But we also wanted to incorporate things from the house because when Julie and I first did our studio visit, I was so excited by all this stuff, and mm -hmm. I was really like, I want that in here. So BJ brought us things from his home and like you've got stuff from your grandparents over there and some very important things and then some just things that pair really well with with everything going on do you find that all that stuff like not inspires you but like puts you in a direction like do you look at different things in the house or is it just an accumulation for you um i mean in in all honesty it's a bunch of stuff i've been carrying <laughs> around for years that i need to get rid of but at the same time, it's kind of, they're, they're little talisman to yeah. people, too, you know? I mean, a lot of it is, a lot of the stuff I've kept is from people that have passed, like friends that are dead or, you know, family members. And I kind of keep these things because I'm really bad about taking photographs. My entire life, I've got a drawer of photographs. It's really tiny, and I never took pictures of anything I ever did. It was just like, it was all in the head movies kind of thing. Um, but I would have these little objects, and that would carry so many memories for me that, you know, yeah. so I I need to get rid of that stuff, and I will eventually, but it's kind of nice to have those people with you Absolutely. still. You know? Absolutely. I yeah. can definitely relate to that. Yeah. Um, so we, we talked about your musicians. You paint a lot of westerns as well. We've got a lot of Wild West in this room. And Nashville's very much a music town, but it's not necessarily like a Southwest cowboy town. So mm -hmm. I know where the country music stars came in. Do you play off of them with the cowboys? Like, where did that interest come from? Originally, I've done these series of kind of buck and broncos, like these big rodeo paintings. Um, and I think a lot of the cowboy stuff, you know, there's such a dialogue now that there hasn't been around um, essentially gender, you know. Um, you know, we're kind of, we face that so intensely now, and everybody's relearning. Um, so I kind of started to do these paintings kind of as a little comment on manliness, you know? I mean, a lot of the paintings, you know, they, they can be kind of abstract in their way, like with the meaning, but it's all pretty much tied to stuff I've gone through or I've thought about, you know? And so, you know, especially growing up in the South, like, heavily religious um you know what it means to be a man is like something you talk about all the time you don't you don't learn about how to take care of people in a way but you learn how to kind of control yourself and puff yourself up like you're a monkey about to get in a fight all the time you know? <laughs> so i i think i think um a lot of the western theme is just kind of tied to that you know, um, and all of that is in question. You know, we're, we're getting better at talking about and to ourselves. Like that was something that's just been so frowned on and it's talked about all the time now. You know, that's, that's like a, that's a conversation everybody's kind of ready to have, which is nice. Um, so at first I started to do those just cause, you know, looking at old Marlboro ads when I was a kid, you know, and so, I kind of just 
did it at first have fun and then I realized I was mentally working through um, stuff for myself. And it was, you know, it's nice to have a little dialogue with just you and you. Kind of Absolutely. And so I think that's kind of what started to happen there. Yeah, and it's like with Clint especially being called like a motive of manliness and just confronting you with this large and also like the red and blue is difficult to look at. You have to sit with it and focus in on mm -hmm. it. It's kind of what you're saying, like having a dialogue, even though you're having that dialogue with yourself, like when someone's looking at especially the red and blues, like Clint, who is so sort of low contrast in a way, in that there's not the fine line detail. And you get that, you have to sit, you have to sit with it, stare mm -hmm. at it, understand it. And that's kind of interesting. And I kind of think he as a figure is that. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of his politics and stuff like that are pretty questionable. Yeah. He's <laughs> not slightly racist. It's like yes. he's very, very intense quiet. and big, big kind of gun guy. I mean, everything he stands for can be seen as questionable now, societally. Um, but he's also a guy that everybody who sees a picture of him, I mean, they love him. Everybody loves him. Hard, yeah, you know? not, yeah. And so with the jarring colors, it was just a way to kind of, you know, that that's kind of extended that that question, you know, to yeah. make it feel kind of like it's encroaching on your personal space just a little bit. And he is, and yeah, I grew up with him too. I mean, even younger people know Dirty Harry, they know. He's a dirty saint. Yeah. He really is. He's definitely from my upbringing. Like when you were yeah. bringing the work in, I was like, yeah, it's really like, I feel like there's a lot of stuff in here that can touch a lot of different ages and different mm -hmm. people. And like the idea. And of you're from life. New York. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so it's amazing to see how geography doesn't really stop that, at least in America. Yeah. I mean, in the rest of the world, there's this kind of excessive quality about about the westerns and biker culture and stuff like that it's, it's fairly american you know and i mean uh, you know a lot of that comes from mexico of course too in spain but um in the states you know just like being a leathery man is what you're <laughs> supposed to do you know and a good shot and, yeah you know and there's questionable stuff that came along with violence and mistreating women and stuff like that and so kind of looking at these people as almost like idols and what they stand for mm -hmm. like a wooden idol you know yeah. instead of it being a person i mean there's a lot of signifiers around these essentially objects they kind of cease being people and become these totems to something bigger you know that we still don't fully understand you know i mean everything we have we took you know um, and so these these singers and these cowboy stars i mean they were essentially our gladiators and warriors you know and so i uh i like the idea of of being able to control their size and what they're wearing <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing yeah there, you Put some me. lipstick on them. Yeah. Every once in a while. <laughs> once red. None of them are in here, but I have some crying cowboy paintings that are really fun. I they're all wearing that. makeup. They look beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You're reminding me of like um, when I teach students about like the iconoclasm and Byzantine art and these tiny mm -hmm. devotional statues. They're always so small. Like a lot of the devotional statues that were for like private worship are little. I love the idea of yeah controlling the size like well this one is big it's confronting you like a lot of people feel like with their or did in those times those private small objects were just for them for that introspection and small and they kind of had the power over that thing but like mm -hmm. you're giving these things the power for you which is really interesting yeah and, and i was i heard on the radio something on npr that was pretty amazing um you know british museum is getting in a lot of trouble for Oh yeah, I can talk about that. It's okay. it's really getting going finally. And come to find out, in all these holy places, their essentially God is just not there. Yeah. And so they worship the empty space where it all sat. Mm -hmm. And kind of culturally, I mean, we're starting to see that because our our culture itself is just becoming very homogenous. Which is cool because people, you know, the underpinning is that we're all the same, but us all us being different is so cool.
cool too. And so we're kind of losing a little bit of balance, especially with entertainment and stuff. It's just gone haywire, you know, and nothing seems as precious. And so we're kind of worshiping, you know, invisible idols in a way. Yeah, and going back to the past, is the past felt more like maybe important or like there was more emphasis on it, kind of like you're saying? Yeah, it's an anchor, yeah. you know. I mean, I, I, we think we understand the past, but we obviously do not. Yeah. yeah, but even just like as like you were saying, these things that you run away from that then provide you comfort when you're in a very different part of your life. Like I've been feeling that a lot lately, and I think it's interesting to be in a whole room of things that do that for you in yeah. some ways, or scare you in some ways. Like, sure. <laughs> married yeah. to God. Do you tell us about him again? Because I I often don't totally remember. Him. Yeah, that's uh, that's swagger. When I was a kid, my grandparents were obsessed with the, you know, the preachers on TV, and that stuff would be playing in the background. And I remember being at my grandparents' house in Boaz, Alabama, and watching Jimmy Swagger just like railing against anything he could. He was sweating everywhere. Come to find out, he's probably blown out of his mind. <laughs> and so. I sat there and, and it was it was kind of scary to me because it was just this guy who they were like, oh, he's right about everything. He's like, he yeah. hates everything, everyone. <laughs> and then Lonesome Dove came on and I loved that. And then the water moccasin attack scene happened, which is, everyone seen Lonesome Dove? Yeah. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> that, that, was, that was our psycho. I think any, any kid that saw that snake and then the credits roll, it's just like, you didn't sleep. You know, that was it. That, that was in your brain and it was never coming out. And so, you know, there was just being told to love all this stuff that just kind of didn't make sense because those things didn't love anything else. And so I, you know, I like Lonesome Dove a lot more than I like Jimmy Swagger, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then we paired them um, with Divine as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I in Nashville, uh, with the laws changing, I was just like, well, I mean, I'm going to flank him with some, you know, beautiful drag action, <laughs> you know, instead, I think he would really dislike that. <laughs> I wish he was here right yes. now. <laughs> maybe he is. Maybe he is. He's still alive, though, isn't he? Is he? Oh, uh, I'll bite him. I think you maybe cast a little spell with those, because tomorrow the drag crawl that goes through the entire neighborhood, this room that you're sitting in right now is going to be their green, green room where they all put on their makeup. Maybe yeah. I did all of this just for them. It's I just didn't for know them. It. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so with that masculinity conversation to go back to that we do have your, a self-portrait of you mm -hmm. in the show our portrait of the artist is a very very bad man yeah um, <laughs> it is very it's different from a lot of the the guys that I think you painted around the room like it's not as uh, I don't know I don't know how to explain it but he's markedly different and so what brought you to make that is that something you've done before? Like, what was that process? When I look at it, I think it's because I kind of love myself less than I do these strange characters. Mm -hmm. you know? um, it's very simplistic and it's pretty ominous. Um, you know, and I mean, a, a, a lot of stuff that's kind of tied to my past. I mean, I've dealt with like a lot of addiction, a lot of violence and stuff like that. It's been a real underpinning of my life. And mm -hmm. I found myself in really, really places and kind of had to be bad to get through it you know and I, I that's a thing I mean you think you know somebody but there's always a deeper well than what you're dipping your toes into with anyone and so you know I spent less I, I started to kind of model myself out and kind of work on it and I just liked that it was kind of ghostly and ghastly all at the same time and I didn't want it to pop out too much, so that gray kind of kept there from being many highlights, so that it was just this very kind of straight read. Um, 
but then the red, you know, I mean, that, that color is tied to, you know, love and lust and violence and, you know, all the fun stuff. And you backlit it. Yeah, so yeah, slightly backlit back so that there was just this kind of, you know, I mean, that's the old gunfighter keep the sun to your back thing, you know. You want the other guy to have the light in his eyes, so having the light come over your shoulders, yeah. what you hope for. Better get there early. You <laughs> <laughs> got that side. Put over here. <laughs> well, we put Clint over here, so this how I'm I like that you did that, so that there's this kind of little showdown happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we have three pieces that are made like this, like with the light box. Was that that was something new that you were doing? I think, right? Had you done these before? Well, originally the cowboy and Marty Robbins. The bummer is I snapped, I had a Marty Robbins that I'd made forever, and I wanted to do these, and I had this really scary basement studio in Inglewood, um, and I started cutting those out down there, because um, I had always kind of wanted to do an installation of walking into a room and seeing all these things kind of staring at that, kind of Pee Wee's Playhouse sort of thing. Um, so I carried those things around, and essentially I just made good on an idea I started 10 years ago. Kind of thing. So the the kind of man from Snowy River esque cowboy on a horse and Marty Robbins, but I'd snap Marty's head off <laughs> on accident and move, so I had to remake him. Okay. Do you still have this head? I've still got the old one. I thought about trying to fix it, but I like that there. It just goes with the rest of the trash in some corner, <laughs> you know. Stuff I'm gonna fix one day. <laughs> In the junk drawer. Yeah. That yeah. Totally. So we've got, we're going to have you play as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to kind of talk about your music making, your art. You're such a, you're very much a Renaissance person. It seems like you are really, really devoted and talented in these things. And do they play off each other for you? Like, are they very separate entities in your life? How does that dialogue? Not at all, really. I mean, my background, especially before I came to Nashville, was I was in these pretty insane bands where you end up bloody and broken bones by the end of a show kind of thing. And I calmed down a lot once I got here, but New York was crazy, probably just because of the amount of speed there was in that town. <laughs> You're just 10 foot tall and bulletproof. You know? yeah. um, so, I mean, I think there's an adrenaline rush. I, I think with visual art, especially, um, coming at it where I didn't have much of a background and I kind of lied my way into this painting program and told them I had all this background and they <laughs> caught me very quick but I was making pretty good stuff and so they let me stay. I think there's there's something to be said for kind of that adrenaline rush of like having all these people in a room with you that aren't there. Yeah. You're always kind of worried of the way it's going to be seen and it feels in its own way like performing. I mean music and painting I kind of get the same feeling from there's this really kind of you against a brick wall kind of moment until stuff starts to work out. And so those two, I don't see them as being any different. Um, I get the exact same feeling. Um, but I have a hard time mixing them at the same time. Yeah. I can only do one, and I'll go on a run with that, and then I'll find a moment. I think that's not served me well because you kind of need to stick on a path, and I'll just kind of ping pong back and forth my entire life. So. Yeah, I'm like pretty good at a lot of things, you know. Um, but I have such an interest in like learning all these crafts. And so music and, and um, art, it's just something you're never going to get to the end of, you know. I mean, there's always going to be somebody better than you. Mm -hmm. And that's cool, you know. And then you're always going to be better than yourself eventually. I mean, the only one you're fighting at the end of the day is you. You really don't have to prove shit to anyone when you think about it. Um, and yet, social media and everything, that's what we're constantly trying to do. You're like comparing yourself to just everything around. You can't even breathe these days without seeing somebody doing something better, or somebody that seems to have it more together than you. So, you know, the art's a good way to work that out. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's productive. You're not blowing all your energy out in the universe. You're making something that, you know, hopefully outlives you or will do something for someone besides yourself, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm glad that people 
have enjoyed what I've done. Mm-hmm. You know, that that means a lot because I'm, I'm I feel very humbled that anyone cares. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I grew up, my mom said I was the saddest five-year-old she'd ever seen, this <laughs> kind of thing. And I think I've just been obsessed with death, because that's all I heard about when I was a kid. It was just all, like, the fire insurance plan, trying not to burn all the time. And somewhere along the way, I just kind of gave up on trying to make sure all that worked out. You know? That's heavy for a kid. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was, I, I had a lot going on pretty young, yeah. and, you know, and it made me, I, I now understand my really self-destructive tendencies, mm-hmm. you know, that's turned around so much in recent years, and now I'm glad to be here for the first time in my life, like, I really never cared, I just, I've used myself like a hammer my entire life, yeah. you know, and so it feels good to actually see ideas take shape you know um but if you look at my house it's like i'm bad at showing stuff to people i just want to make it once it's out i kind of don't care anymore i just kind of move along yeah so So this has been great seeing seeing stuff actually hanging up because i haven't really you all reaching out to me meant a lot because i haven't tried to show anyone any work in i don't know how many I had a show in Nashville right when I moved from New York, and that was well over a decade ago. And I had like two pieces in the group show, and I just never really, I kept making stuff, but I just didn't really care if anybody saw it. Yeah. And seeing people take interest in it, you know, sometimes you just need a little positive push in a direction. Yeah. So, I mean, now I've got like 15 paintings going since we got this <laughs> going, and I'm stoked about them. I wish they were here now, you know? It's funny you say it that way, because, like, yeah, when we when we came for a studio visit, like, everything's stacked, and you're, like, taking it apart to show, and, like, it's, like, you don't even remember what you have, because I guess, like, and it sounds like for you, you got what you needed to get out, and you're, like, okay, that's out, and now I can put it over here, and now that's out, and I can put it over here. Yeah, you know, it's just Tetris, yeah. in a way. You're just mentally fitting little blocks together, and something makes you feel better, and something doesn't. You know, I mean, I, writing songs is so crazy. If I hadn't somehow written them on pieces of paper or something, I would never remember anything I had done, you know. And I still go through stacks of envelopes. I'm like, oh my God, I forgot about <laughs> 10, 10 tunes I wrote kind of thing. And it's the same way with art, you know. Um, I just, it goes somewhere hidden and I just don't even Do you find that like these these country artists that you write or drew and painted and, and worked with, do you find that they are kind of what made you move away from like the heavier music that you started in? Like what was that? How was that transition? Because your music is very different now from what I know you used to do. Mm-hmm. And like I was out getting kicked in the face at metal shows too. So yeah, I don't know what it's yeah. like used to be there. Um I, I think a lot of that came that came mostly I, I've been writing these songs, but they just never went into that band format because yeah. they just were completely, they seemed like polar opposites. But, you know, a lot of that came about in 2016. I had an accident where I just blew my back up mm-hmm. and couldn't even have surgery. I just lost so much bone mass. And so the thought of doing physically what it took for me to do in that musical context, I didn't think I was ever going to be able to do it again. And so I kind of got stuck laying on a massage table for 18 months face down. And that was, you know, you start scraping your brain pretty hard. Then you got to get zen or get dead kind of thing in that scenario. (laughs) And so I started to learn to play all the instruments I didn't know because I can play drums and I um, and so, you know, uh, a lot of the music I'm doing now is just exploring. I just started to buy these crappy instruments and learn to play, and I kind of learned to play everything I never had known how to. And in some ways, you know, I lucked out getting hurt that bad. You know, it was an absolute nightmare, but it gave me something to do. Like I took French lessons for a year 
during that, and I can't remember. So I had no idea. Just, I keep, well, I would not be able to converse with you. We're not going to do that. We'll conduct, we'll conduct the rest of the interview in French and gibberish. You could try to convince me like you convinced the painting school. You want to? Yeah, I think we wait. Um, Uh, goodbye to lose. Goodbye to lose. Mm -hmm. um, I love that painting. Could you? Uh, yeah, that that image of the woman on a zebra um, is this recurring image that was in a lot of um, a lot of Art Nouveau uh, stuff. And Toulouse Lautrec essentially um, that that would be in backgrounds of his weird crayon drawings and stuff. Um, and also, I think it was Alicia, were we talking about the woman? Yeah, that there was a woman who would ride um, around, essentially, the Moulin Rouge on a zebra. Um, and they, which was so odd, she must have been so tiny because they can't carry any weight with her legs or break kind of thing. So I kind of did that um, painting. That was one of the first ones I did when I was like, my body was really heavily and so I, how I came to that image, I mean, you see that in clip art and stuff too, all over the place. And so that's not really something I came up with, but when I started to see, um, you know, it was interesting that I painted it and started to kind of see the significance of it. Like I went to a psychic one time and left thinking, I was like, that fucker doesn't know me at all. Like, I was like, I guess that was kind of a waste of time. And then three months later, it was just, it was really wild that I saw all the, all the points kind of hit. And so that painting was one of the first ones I did um, after I got hurt. And it was a big painting, and I kind of used it to sort of stretch my body and be able to hold my arms up because I was in a giant back brace and having to, you know, lean on a walker the whole time. And somebody was telling me I should paint on the floor, but I, it was when I could finally be upright. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's kind of kind of how I came to that. And the old look of it, I mean, I when I worked in film, my job, I never worked as a scenic painter proper, but I was always in the art department. They would have me run around and essentially age things. I'm really good at that, um, and I have a lot of fun with all the power tools and sprays and stuff. And so I kind of did that on that painting. You know? um, so yeah, I guess that one's special in that um, when I did that, I realized I was going to be able to keep working to some degree. It has a delicacy, mm -hmm. uh, and also a double format. I think that's the second one. Yeah, I, I had I had so many more females that I didn't get finished with, and I realized it's like, oh, this is a, just a very testosterone kind of show, you know. And I feel like her and the Rams head, and and Sweet Divine, you know, like they, you know, they're they're holding holding a lot of weight against all these, you know. Yeah. Kind of rough necks yeah. <laughs> the rest yeah, of it. I, I, I think I remember those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So thank you, because I, I do I do love that piece. I like the simplicity of it. Um, I I was really like obsessed for a long time with the kind of Bolshevik posters, you know, the hard red, white, and black propaganda posters, the communist posters. I just I love like that stuff. Thing. Definitely got the point across, kind of thing. Why do you love them? Because they just, they're stark. You know, I mean, it is undeniable. People wanted to get an opinion out, and they did it in grand fashion. And there's also a reason most of those artists were executed, you yeah. know, which is terrifying. And a lot of them really didn't have the political leanings, but once. 
once everything toppled, they found all those artists and they killed them all. You know, um, it's buried. You know, and so I I really love um, I I love the kind of juxtaposition of using a very harsh kind of visual element to say something a little more delicate. You know? And the drips, you know, like having water essentially be the surface of that painting it was a lot of fun to work with the spray and just kind of let things sort of happen because I also got so tired when I was making it um, that I wanted to break up the ground and so I couldn't lift my arms anymore and so I just got spray bottles and started <laughs> So that's that's how that came about. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. CJ, uh, what made you go from the realistic rendition of color to the red, blue, eye popping, brain melting color palette? Well, I had I had done uh, some of that in school. Um, one way I got through school was I got a big grant, and I had to have these. I had to have some real large pieces, um, and I kind of drank my way up to the show and hadn't really done anything. And I'd been reading a lot of the uh, Joseph Albers color theory, mm -hmm. and um, you know everything he was pushing for was this kind of tranquil, peaceful feeling. And I kind of started to look at the wheel and be like, oh, there's also all these colors yeah, with all the pew. <laughs> um, and so I, I kind of dropped into those and had a really crazy successful student show um, in doing that. So it's been something I've always done. Um, but the more you work those harsh, Kind of disparate colors um they they the more it takes your focus off them and so the real simple movement because i as you can see it's like a lot of stuff i kind of try to be really careful and it drives me crazy i wish i was like a lot more free you know like your stuff and julia's you know like but um i i found that when i started doing these you know just the simpler the better and it was fun to just kind of have real simple gestural stuff. So the less movement, the more opping kind of happens with those you colors. The opping is like the shaking of the colors when together. You have to take a break after you work on them because your eyes are all messed up. This one's a little more muted and it wasn't too bad. That one, yeah. I saw that for probably an hour. It was perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I'm like, laughs> And I stood for a long time kind of working on that. And I, I, you know, I, I just had a really heavy spot on it, so it was like kind of reflective. And I had the lights out in the rest of the house and trying to find light switches. And everything. I was like, oh my God. Like, so yeah, that was, that was a total pain, actually. Um, is that something you continue with? Because you said you did these for your student show. Are, are, are oh, no, that was a long time ago. Okay. Those were these huge waves. Oh, okay. um, so these that, are newer than that? What's that? These are newer than your student Yeah, show? I just did these yes. um, a few weeks ago. Um, you know, I mean, these color pairings, there's something kind of powerful in so much. It's kind of like those Bolshevik posters. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at them and they, they're yeah. harsh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at that student show, one of the judges walked in and I was outside smoking cigarettes and drinking beer and some stairwell or something. And somebody came out and they were like, the judge threw up in the trash. Because these things were gigantic. And so I was like, she stood there and looked at him and got dizzy and threw wow. up. That's a great like, compliment. Dumped, dumped Such a visceral response. response. And so I, I, for some reason, was like, all right, I guess I blew that. <laughs> and it turns out, like, it turned out pretty good. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and put me through college. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely something I'm always going to mess with. Okay. You know? And I, I love the little orange and blue one mm -hmm. out by the door, too. I love that painting. Oh, my God, we're hanging that. And I, just, I stared at it for so long, and I put it up, and I was like, it's crazy. No, it's not. Is it? I don't know. And every time I look at it, I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, it's it's pretty cool that colors, when paired, create their own movement. Yeah. There's something really watery, and you know, I mean, you can't trust your own spatial judgment sometimes no, 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 when yeah. looking at them. You know, 
they really do like burn into your retinas. Yeah, and if really you really, really focus on a spot on one and then immediately stare at the white wall, mm -hmm. it's pretty true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what we found is sometimes with the lights out in the oh. dark is when they really shake really hard. Um, and then we discovered skeletal. And then she started seeing <laughs> stuff in that. <laughs> then maybe I meant to be in that. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally. <laughs> Alicia and I actually were like, oh, skeletal. <laughs> it's like clothes when you turn the lights on. It's so weird. It's like accident. And with every mezcal, he got more <laughs> pronounced. <laughs> it's cool to look at those and like look at the black on blacks because they are, they require attention in a very different way. But mm -hmm. it's like, it's like that where it's like, Oh my god, I have to figure this out. But mm -hmm. with this one, it's like, oh, I have to really look at this and study it and find. And you find different things in that, a similar way to the way you find it. Yeah, the black on black is something I really dig because you can't really photograph. Them. Yeah. And I have a bunch of them at home, really and like it's. That. You know, having something that you can't really show on a computer screen so well, you kind of have to be in the room and see the reflective quality of it. I like the idea of being forced, you know, if you want to look at it, but being forced to be in front of it rather than just flipping through it, you know, like we're kind of used to doing. So the black on black was kind of a cool way to just kind of force that hand. I like that. I like that you're trying to force interaction. And like you talked mm -hmm. about social media before. Like I just went to a video art video art show and there's my favorite art is the stuff that is environmental. You have to go experience it. Somebody has to go throw up yeah. in front of it and have understood it. That's to me, that's like doing the best job in my mm -hmm. experience, like what I look for. I guess maybe this adds some kind of like just two D performance, you know, yeah. some of these color pairing paintings. It is, know. it's interactive spectatorship. Like people make fun of performance art, but there's nothing more subversive than that. Totally. You know, that's the most visceral thing there is. Absolutely. You know, um, hands down, things like that. Other questions and thoughts? I have a question about this painting right behind you. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like a stencil. Um, and I'm wondering how you picked out what you wanted to be the negative space and the positive space. That's tough because red doesn't cover. Red paint, I mean, you can't go back with the red. And so that was what was actually hard about this is it had, it, it was really a controlled movement. I mean, this looks like the simplest thing maybe in the gallery to do, but in reality, it was the hardest because you don't, have the option of going back, you know, without going back in with primers and reworking everything and sanding it. So, um, in school, a lot of my stuff was much more graphic and it did look like screen prints. And some people loved it and some people hated it. I like the idea of doing a single, you know, instead of it being this mass producible kind of image. And so, how I went about picking that, I mean, I just kind of stood with the photograph and just kind of slowly worked my way through it and um, picked, picked spots where I could add some speed, a little more gestural, but all in all, like blocking that out took a minute mm -hmm. just because I knew I wasn't going to be able to flip flop. It was like once I did it, I was going to have to work with it. So, I think, I think the screen print looking element of it is heightened because of the colors, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, that color choice because it is just going to instantly have this like really harsh barrier, you know, between the two, like just walled off against itself, you know, it's kind of got an oil and water thing. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. I have a question. Um, Obviously, we both are painting snakes, and I would love to hear you talk more about your attraction to them. Yeah, and Becca Jane, whose stuff is in the corner, it's amazing, beautiful. Um, the uh, the uh, snake thing. I mean, our mom used to take us out when we were little kids to these. Like, we grew up kind of 
on the edge of the Smokies, and there weren't snake handling churches out there, but I did end up kind of going to some snake handling churches with a drunk buddy of mine. We kind of did this sojourn, like up in the West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, um, but there were these, you know, and and kind of like where my the music I play goes. There's some pretty ghastly stuff in there. I remember sitting in this church where this old man was just singing this like horrific violent song, essentially about killing a woman he was in love with, and I was sitting in a church, and I was just like, oh my god, like, this guy's just going to set on fire. <laughs> I felt like that in itself was a sin. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, snakes and these, these kind of religious buildings that hold so much in, I, I heard this story about a family who's Son, I guess he they realized he was gay and he was a little kid and they um, draped snakes all over him and he was bit and they wouldn't take him to the doctor and someone found out about it. I feel like this was in Kentucky and it was probably like 10 years ago. This was not something that happened a long time ago. Someone found, they, they refused to take this kid, this sweet little boy, to a hospital, and someone in the night drove to town and got the cops. And when they got back, um, they, they took him out of there, but he ended up losing his arm. He didn't die. And so, around that time, you know, I mean, all the Ouroboros and, um, you know, these, these kind of snakes are seen as these very scary kind of alchemical like creatures you know and so i got really into that because these things aren't violent either you know they're just animals that want to be left alone so um that's a rambling way of how i started I to like do that. the snakes I mean, <laughs> and, and and being in that environment like my my buddy um he was taking photographs he's a photographer and they, this church, they felt like he was there to make fun of them, and so they, they're like, you, you can have your cam. They kind of blocked the door off, and like, you can have your camera back after you show us why you're here. And so they put snakes all over him, and and he's like, you know, not religious in any way, and he's like, oh my god, and he went through with it, and mm -hmm. didn't get bit, and gave him his camera back, and. You know, seeing that mm -hmm. and also like smelling all those snakes oh, in a room. Yeah. It's really <laughs> wild. Like a while back, like I almost I got into it, you know, people say there aren't a bunch of copperhead around here. Uh -huh. That's oh, not there true. Are. There's tons of There's them. So many. <laughs> and you can smell them. Like I learned growing up in the smokies, they smell like celery. And so being um, and my dog and I almost got nailed by one on a trail a while back. So being in that closed room that just felt very musty anyway and sweat and then over top of it was this really acrid kind of salty vinegar like snake smell was really cool <laughs> like i can think of like really dangerous strange things i've seen in my life mm -hmm. and i kind of feel lucky that i got to see yeah. them because like some people go their whole lives without seeing that Absolutely. you know um so that that was cool. So you know, um, the snakes started showing up. That Don Stover, um, that was the first one. The one over by the door oh, yeah. was the first the guy with the banjo. That was the first one I did with those. And originally they were going to all be the work for us, but like over time they started to kind of just do their thing, mm -hmm. like the Hank Snow. There's something a little more interactive and a little less symbolic. I mean, I think they're still symbolic, but you know. Not as immediately simple as that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the Winnie the Pooh motif is a little <laughs> different than everything else in the room, and just a little curious of why you decided to include it, and uh, you know what's its place in the show. Yeah. Well, originally they weren't going to be in um, because they didn't seem to make any sense. Um, and Julia and Jen decided, they were like, like, screw it, we're just gonna put all this stuff in. And now that they're in here, I mean, I think a lot of this stuff is essentially about my childhood to some degree, you know? 
we we were raised in kind of a yeah, I would say it was a cult at this point. It's kind of recognized as that at this point, the church we were at. And um, being so sheltered, you know, the first thing you're going to do is, you know, absolutely slingshot your way um, the other direction to pull the hard one. Maybe. So the Winnie the Pooh stuff, I mean, I, I think those are, you know, slightly autobiographical. And so I think that's how they ended up fitting in. It just kind of made sense because why not? Sort of thing. Yeah. Do we want to transition to music? Sure. Thank you yeah. so much for participating. Yeah.